This is Jimmy Powers, and happy to be coming your way with another Grantland Rice story. This is Jimmy Powers, transcribed, about to bring you another chapter from the Grantland Rice story, The Tumult and the Shouting. Today we're putting the finger of immortality on some of the great athletes of the past and present who, through their unquestioned stamina, rank high in what Granny calls iron ore content. So with a nod to the young and heart spirit of Granny Rice, I once again open the book and take up the narrative in first person. <laughs> There aren't any Ironmen left in sport today, but then, yesterday, there weren't any Roger Bannisters, John Lundy's, or Wes Santee's either. The old-time Ironman has been replaced by the modern specialist in business as well as sports. However, the age of the Ironman was largely from another era, and I knew my share of them. If Ty Cobb wasn't an Ironman, who was? Ty traveled at top speed on a pair of fairly thin legs for 24 years. He hunted all winter, and he played baseball all spring and summer. He played in more than 3,000 ball games, and he scored over 4,000 runs, always in rapid action. If Cy Young wasn't an Iron Man, who was? Cy left a small farm in Ohio in 1890 for Cleveland. His square name was Denton. But after he had been given a tryout and had knocked the boards right out of the backstop with his high hard one, one critic said it looked as if a cyclone had hit the place. After that, it was no longer Denton Young, but Cy for Cyclone Young. In Cy's first game, he shut out Chicago three to nothing, then won more games, 511, than most pitchers ever pitched. He worked through more than 800 ball games in both leagues and finally retired when the kid named Grover Cleveland Alexander beat him one to nothing in 1911. Bob Fitzsimmons had a large vein of iron ore in his system. He was born in Cornwall, England in 1862, 18 years before I arrived on this planet. Began fighting bouts at 18 and didn't stop until he was 52. Never more than an overgrown middleweight himself, Fitz won the heavyweight crown from James J. Corbett at Carson City, Nevada when he was 35. Bill Tilden certainly had an overdose of iron content to play the brand of tennis he featured for 30 years. Another iron man, Jack Quinn, was in the majors from 1909 through 1933 and was pitching big league ball at 47. His reason? A wife and six kids. Willie Hoppy in championship billiards since 1908 is another amazing mixture of stamina and hairline skill. Having amassed 51 world titles, Willie recently estimated he'd spent more than 100,000 hours over the billiard tables and had walked some 26,000 miles in 59 years of chasing a cue ball. There were wrestlers and bike riders, Strangler Lewis and Frank Kramer, yes, and Reggie McNamara, the cyclist, who seemed to go on indefinitely despite hundreds of crack-ups on the velodromes around the world. But there are two iron men who are especially close friends. One was a baseball player, the other a football player. Their names were Lou Gehrig and Pudge Heffelfinger. Both were physical giants. 
Lou Gehrig was slightly over six feet and well over 200 pounds. He was perfectly built for power, bull-throated and bare of arm. The first time I ever saw Gehrig was on a Thanksgiving afternoon in 1922 at New York. Columbia was playing Colgate. I brought Dick Harlow, Colgate's famous coach, home with me after the game. Colgate, with Eddie Tryon at his best, had murdered the Lions. But there was a Columbia back who also impressed Dick. He was a young giant named Gehrig. About midway in the stampede, he broke his right collarbone. He finished the game with a useless right arm and shoulder, but he stuck to his job. When I saw Gehrig again, he was a ball player for the New York Yankees. Wally Pipp was hurt one day in 1925, and Gehrig moved into first base. That was Pipp's last appearance as a Yankee. When Gehrig finally retired after eight games in 1939, he had played 2,130 consecutive games over a period of 15 years without missing his appointment at first base. When I played golf with Babe Ruth years ago, we often stopped by to pick up Lou. He followed us around the course, but he wouldn't play. He had an idea that the baseball swing and the golf swing were too dissimilar, that golf was bad for baseball. One morning, I dropped a ball and handed him Ruth's mid-iron. He took a smooth, easy swing and hit a perfect shot out some 200 yards. I couldn't get him to hit another. It was the same with hunting. Lou enjoyed hiking along for company, but he wouldn't shoot anything. I just can't kill, he told me. To Gehrig, a quail, a duck, or a dove was a beautiful bird. That's the sort of fellow he was, tremendously powerful, but as gentle as a child. If Lou hadn't been struck down when almost in his prime, he might have carried his mark to 3,000 consecutive games, for he never cottoned to an injury or illness. Lou somehow struggled through eight games of the 39 schedule before he went to manager Joe McCarthy's hotel room in Detroit and quietly put down his glove. After 2,130 consecutive games, the Iron Horse, at 36 years of age, had completed its final run. Two years later, in June 1941, Lou passed away. With the passing of Gehrig and Ruth in seven years, I lost two irreplaceables. The other Iron Man was a football player known as William W. Pudge Heffelfinger, born and reared in Minneapolis. Pudge was on Walter Camp's All-American teams of 1889, 1890, and 1891. He was another giant, better than six feet and some 190 pounds, but he was faster than most halfbacks. Years later, when Pudge pushed about 230 pounds but remained hard as granite, he became a walking legend of Yale football. When you looked at Pudge, you almost expected to see in the background the mystic figures of John L. Sullivan, Pop Anson, Snapper Garrison, Harry Varden, Barney Oldfield, and other unbelievables of the bygone sports era. Joe Williams once said that he had heard and read so much about Pudge that, until he actually met him, he was certain the old boy never existed. Around 1915, after practice one day, Walter Camp, then Yale's coach, called Pudge to one side and said, The trouble with you, Hef, is that you play guard only one way. You are a fine guard, but remember, there are at least two ways to play your position. I began to study things and practice on students, related Pudge. They soon began to run when they saw me. Ten days later, I told Camp I had followed his advice, and now I had six different ways to play guard. Heffelfinger was undoubtedly the first of the running guards. I mean the pull-out and lead the interference type. He was a terrific blocker. When Pudge was 43 or 44, he returned to Yale for several days. Tad Jones was the coach. Pudge lined up with the scrubs, much against Tad's wishes. He was afraid a man of 44 playing against 20-year-olds might be hurt. That was an historic afternoon. When the scrubs got the ball, Pudge turned to Jess Spaulding, second-team halfback, and said, Jess, follow me. I followed him, related Spaulding. I also ran 55 yards for a touchdown with at least four tacklers sprawled out on the field. Every man Pudge hit was flattened. Heffelfinger was a bit sore about that scrimmage. You know, Grant, he said, they said I broke a couple of Cupy Black's ribs. I didn't. I happened to bump into a man and drove him into Black. The collision occurred just a week before the Princeton game and two weeks before the Harvard game. It marked the last time Heffelfinger was allowed on Yale Field in a football suit. 
When Pudge was 52, he played in a professional charity game at Columbus, Ohio. Bo McMillan, famed center college hero and later a fine coach, was quarterback. Before the game, Pudge somehow dislocated his shoulder, but twisted it and jerked it until the shoulder snapped back. McMillan told me they didn't think Pudge would last five minutes. Heffelfinger played 54 minutes of that game, related McMillan, him 53 and me 22. He played one of the best games at guard I ever saw. Shortly before his death at Blessing, Texas in the spring of 1954, Pudge was in New York for a touchdown club dinner and an award. I remember him saying, Grant, it's fun to look back on a half century of football playing, but I'm reconciled to a seat in the stadium now, even if it's not on the 50-yard line. I know folks say I never outgrew a campus hero complex, but at least they know I never rested on my oars. I stood up to them all for three generations. That night, I toasted Pudge with these lines. As we look them over in the big corral, as the years march by, as they rise and fall, here's to big Pudge, my pick and my pal, the greatest Roman of them all. Right up to the end, Pudge Heffelfinger carried into life's battle all the enthusiasm of a rookie. That closes the book on another chapter from the Grantland Rice story, The Tumult and the Shouting. Until next we meet, this is Jimmy Powers transcribed saying to you, the best of the bestest.